thank you for tuning back in. The concept of security, as it becomes more networked, we are expanding the concept of supply chain security with our next panel, Supply Chain Reactions, Vulnerabilities at Scale. I'll hand over to Katrina. So good evening. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as moderator, I would like to, to take this opportunity to thank the team at ORA, uh, to thank Tricia for all the hard work um, for organizing this session and inviting us back to this year's sci-fi. It goes without saying, and I'm sure I'm not alone in wishing I was with you in Delhi this evening amongst our dear friends and colleagues. Um, that said, I hope you're all staying safe and we'll meet again um, in, uh, very soon. So as Trisha explained, the theme of today's session is supply chain reactions, uh, vulnerabilities at scale. We have four experts with us. Um, we have Sean Canuck, who is the founder and CEO of Exadec. Um, I have been asked um, uh, not to go through each of our, our um, panelists' bios at length, so please refer to the, um, uh, the website if you'd like to know more about each of our panelists. So I will stick to the instructions um, uh, of the team. So we have Sean, we have Alicia Garcia Herrero, who is a chief economist at um, the Natixis in Asia Pacific. We have Usal Sabaz, who is president um, at EDAM. And we have um, Mr. Sunjoy, Sunjoy Joshi, um, who is chairman and, and um, known by everybody, of course, the chairman of the um, Observer Research Foundation. So we have a very strong panel, and I'm sure we will have um, a great conversation as the evening proceeds. Um, with respect to, and again, for those of you who have joined some of the prior sessions, um, you will know by now that uh, the, the format has changed slightly to um, the traditional sci-fi format. So we are not, I, I, I'm not going to give any intervention as moderator and our, our experts are not going to make interventions per se um, at the beginning. We're going to jump straight into the questions um, because we have 45 minutes um, for a good conversation. So with that, one of the first driving questions um, I have been asked to explore very specifically is the restructuring of technology supply and value chains in the wake of US sanctions will likely um, impact or bite Chinese um, as well as American companies in the short term, possibly creating opportunities for nearshoring towards South and Southeast Asia. So with this in mind, um, the question that we would like to raise this evening for our panelists is the so-called challenge to the dominance of these two powers in technology supply chains overhyped, or will current trends see a meaningful restructuring? So I'm going to move through each of our panelists. Um, I'm starting, um, if you don't mind, um, Sunjoy, I'm going to start with, with you uh, with respect to this question and then ask some of our other panelists to speak to these issues. So I'll pass the floor to you. Uh, thank you. Uh uh, thank you for uh, asking these questions. Now, coming to the whole issue of supply chain vulnerabilities, uh, let me start by saying, you know, the way supply chains are structured and the way the supply chains have come to exist in these few years, Toyota will tell you it takes 30,000 parts to make a car, but then there's just one part. If that is missing, it will not be made. And uh, these are about physical parts, but they are just other things which are not physical parts. There is design, there is testing, there is validation, and that is how supply chains have been built up, you know, which have, which have spanned the whole world. Now, post-pandemic, post, -pandemic, post uh, the entire question of the US-China tech war and the trade war, companies are now being pushed to suddenly consider, you know, they've been over these years built up a uh, just-in-time model where you just, you know, you cut down costs, you got competence where they were, use information technology to cut down inventory costs, cut down labor costs. And from that, they are now being pushed into a just-in-case scenario. Now, just that typical Hollywood case, you know, that, that Hollywood movie syndrome of saying, what if, what if this were to happen, your supply chains should still remain not vulnerable. The point is that transferring from a just-in-time model to a just-in-case model 
there are costs to it and the costs can be very high at times. The point is efficiency gains with the bread and butter of information technology as it built the vast supply chains getting around the whole world. Now these are to be replaced by the costs of ensuring against all kinds of contingency risks. For example, the pandemic, that, that is a risk. The second thing is that, yes, if there's a splintered world of China tech versus US tech, that certainly again adds to more costs besides becoming a world which probably will be much slower to innovate. Now, what kind of impact that is going to make on the possible, possible rollout of IR4, which the whole world was getting ready for, which was being toasted hungrily at Davos, you know, in the, in, the, in the last two sessions which we had. Is this going to get more delayed in what is going to become an illiberal, illiberal closed 21st century? Now, as we, as we move forward, big question which economies are going to face is, now in the post-pandemic world, if recovery, and we are seeing economy suffer. If recovery is going to be actually what is being talked of as a K-shaped recovery, where you know, parts of the economy move at different paces. Some people move ahead at a faster pace. Some people get further and further left behind. Now that is certainly going to impact the entire social structure. So yes, there are, there are certain costs which uh, the restructuring of supply chains are going to impose. And those costs are going to be rather difficult costs. It's a, it's, it is easy for governments to impose uh, tariff barriers. It is easy for governments to impose all kinds of restrictions. But the point remains that these work like sledgehammers. Governments by nature, the, 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 the will of governments does not work with dexterity. So the impact when it goes down the line, what it disturbs, where it disturbs is sometimes very difficult to tell and supply chains which have got entangled you know so desperately over these many years are not going to be disentangled overnight this is going to take time and this is going to take effort thank you thank you sunjoy um I liked hearing from you about the move from the just-in-time model to a just-in-case model um, and, and the consequences and costs that that will bring. And in particular, um, the fact that um, we're facing into a world that might be slower to innovate. And I think that's a nice segue um, into asking Asal his thoughts on the question, given your specialisms on innovation, Asal. So I'll pass the floor to you if that's okay. Oh, sorry. Yes, if, if you're if you're ready to speak to the question, that would be great. Absolutely, absolutely. So let me. So uh, Mr. Joshi mentioned the K-shaped recovery, which has been characterizing what has been happening in the stock markets as well as in the real economy so far, and the K-shape has one arm the digital which is rising and the other arm the traditional which is falling this is similar i think for the supply chains as well uh, the traditional supply chains meaning the manufacturing supply chains uh, have suffered from the uh, pandemic uh, they have slightly recovered but they will be restructured uh, due to the concerns uh, mr joshi has already mentioned now, there will be winners and losers from this. But let me talk a bit about the digital supply chains because the real recovery is on the digital and, you know, uh, the dominance of the economy is likely to be on the digital uh, from now and then. Uh, now, on the digital supply chains, uh, I have logged in uh, to this GeoMeet platform for this panel. It was a pleasure and it was easy. Uh, but it shows us something. Uh, the emerging market countries are willing to localize their digital supply chains. India established its geo platform and it has many things. It's not only the mobile, it's not only the social, it even has this, you know, uh, 
e, alternative to Zoom video meeting platform, which I think is very interesting. E, now, the global digital companies, Google, Facebook, etc., do not really have supply chains in the emerging markets like, like GE has, like Procter and Gamble has, like these traditional manufacturing companies have. Uh, they have been non-existent from the emerging markets and the restructuring of the supply chains, the mirror image from the traditional supply chains to the digital is likely to be that the governments of the emerging markets will increasingly force these companies to localize. That will be a precondition for these companies to operate in these markets. Now, we also have the issue of scale. The scale of India to the scale of Turkey or to the scale of Mexico or to the scale of Indonesia are different. Now, if you have enough scale, you are able to establish your own Zoom platform like GeoMeets, right? Whereas it may not be feasible for Turkey to do this because the scale is much smaller. Now, one of the questions that needs to be discussed is what is the optimal scale to localize the digital supply chains and what is the you know bargaining point that the governments of these emerging market countries to start with these digital global giant companies to discuss how to localize their operations now let me uh, finish with an example from turkey what's happening recently and uh, i also wrote this in the uh, sci-fi edit which was a very you know interesting collection of essays from around the world. Uh, Turkey asked the social media companies to localize their data, their user data, and to establish a legal representation in the country. Uh, after intense negotiations in the parliament, uh, we actually dropped the enforcement of the data localization uh, article, uh, but we kept the you know, uh, legal representation requirement. And now, Facebook, for example, is refusing to establish the legal representation, and there is a bargaining process going on. Now, Turkey has a small scale to bargain with these digital companies. Some countries do have a larger scale. China has a huge scale, so it, it was able to establish its own supply chain and ecosystem. So these questions of scale for the emerging markets and the bargaining power is likely to determine to what extent the digital supply chains will be localized and to what extent we will have a mirror image of you know physical supply chains that Procter and Gamble has GE has Siemens has in our countries with all these digital giants that are now benefiting from the upper arm of the K-shaped re recovery and is likely to shape the rest of the uh, you know the economy uh, or the global economy in the rest of this decade thank you very much Thank you very much, Usal. I really appreciate your interventions. Um, uh, and in particular, I think your point that emerging markets um, are now willing to uh, localize their own supply chains and offering, and that scale will matter even more so as we move forward, um, both respect to, with respect to localizing the digital supply chains, but also when it comes to uh, bargaining power with uh, global corporations. Um, so, so actually on that point, um, I might pass the uh, mic to Sean, if uh, Sean's able to unmute. Thank you very much and good evening. Uh, I'd like to begin by seconding Katrina's comments. Uh, greetings to all of our international participants and uh, wish we could be there in person like previous years. But. Uh, in lieu of that, uh, this video format is very good. And in response to the question, I absolutely appreciate the two previous speakers who framed this discussion in terms of logistics, risk, contingency, and regulation, because I think when we're talking about physical or digital supply chains, especially at scale, we need to be thinking about risk and contingency and even insurance. So it becomes a much different discussion than some of the traditional cybersecurity discussions that have been presented at Sci-Fi in previous years and elsewhere. The two thoughts I'd like to add to what's already been stated are in recent years we've seen widespread discussion of inherent flaws in chipsets, Intel, AMD, and others. 
uh, notably the Meltdown and Spectre exploits. And then we've seen, uh, at least back to 2017 and other examples, uh, with NotPetya, the transmission of a cyber attack through, in that case, it was accounting software in Ukraine. And so whether we're talking about the physical components or the digital applications, these supply chains have worldwide effects and need to be viewed as such. Now, specifically addressing the question of will there be a meaningful restructuring away from the uh, two uh, hegemons in this space, if you will, to date, China and the United States, I think we have to look at three inherent aspects, the first being innovation, and I thank Usal for his discussion on that point. I don't have much to add other than innovation is critically important, and in addition to having the talent to create new products, the market share uh, also matters, your, your indigenous user base for expansion. Secondly, I think we have to talk about research and investment, and that is traditionally where the United States, China, and certain countries in Europe or the European Union writ large have been leaders and able to dominate some of these supply chains by either bringing the necessary talents to their corporate innovation sectors like Silicon Valley, and in the case of other more authoritarian economies, actually being able to bring government efforts, support, and financing to those efforts. And I know our previous panel discussed some of those features in regard to 5G and companies like Huawei and ZTE. But uh, to give a direct answer to the question in summary, when I look at these various factors of market size, innovation capacity, research, and investment, uh, I do think that you're going to continue to see those factors favoring countries such as the United States and China who can marshal immense resources to these aspects. Uh, I think there will be some inflection and shifting to nearshoring, as the question stated, but I think it will be very difficult for smaller countries with less investment capability and less of an international draw to uh, world-class talent innovation centers to be able to compete. And, and then of course, as you saw said, which companies, which of these global companies is going to be investing or relocating significant efforts to many of the uh, smaller countries, regardless of how capable their technology innovation is. So I think we're seeing some reactions, but I don't think you're gonna see a wholesale restructuring simply because of research and investment limitations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, in essence, um, what, what we're going to, uh, what you see is likely is that we will see some reactions, but not a wholesale restructuring for the reasons that you already described. And I think that's, um, again, a really um, effective segue to hear from Alicia. Um, I can't see Alicia on the call, but hopefully she can hear me. Um, if Alicia would like to provide her thoughts from an economist perspective. Yeah. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks for the invitation. I hope you can see me and you can hear me. Um, but yeah, so I I found the you know the comments so far very enlightening. Um, they made me think about the difference between an economist and you know the rest of the of the group here uh, because you're touching on things that are probably more important than economics. But I'm going to add my bit to it and. I want to start by saying that global value chains are kind of hard and soft, as you said. I mean, there's a hard part and a soft part, and they do not need to go together. What I'm trying to say here is that while I, I find the soft part, I data, um, much harder to replicate, I, I do think that we're moving into, you know, two ecosystems, maybe three, maybe, maybe four, maybe Europe, India, you know, um, um, the US and China, maybe three, maybe Europe won't be there. It, it's a big question to to ask. But the point is, I find that more plausible than that ended up with, with, you know, just a couple of hardware value chains around. And the reason is that I think vertical integration today is easier than in the past. So basically, 
and not for every product, no doubt about it, but you know, I'm, I'm now actually, as we speak in Taipei, and I've, I've seen what has happened with a lot of medical devices since COVID-19 started, and how part of the, of the production has been reshored for obvious reasons, um, to be able to accommodate the demand from masks to ventilators, you know, and how fast it has been done, because at the end of the day, you know, the, the, it, it's all about where you stand in the value chain. And I think part of that value chain today is replicable in even in the smaller economies. So my take on this is that there's going to be fragmentation of the hard part of the value chain, maybe not on the soft part, data-driven value chain. Um, and the reason is, first, of course, strategic supplies. We've seen what has happened, you know, Japan with subsidies for medical devices. Basically, that idea that I can't run away of something important, that's one. And that doesn't make much economic sense in good times, but it may make economic sense overall if you think about, you know, the risk you run if you don't do that. But but beyond that, I think we had exhausted the benefits of, again, I'm talking about manufacturing here, yeah, value chains, because we had gone to a model where the complexity was basically going beyond what was needed. You know, you, you could see parts and components moving 30, 40 times. And the reason being that, you know, sometimes wouldn't even make economic sense. Maybe they would, you know, at the cost of transportation at a certain instance, but not when the cost of transportation would double for either old prices or geopolitical risk because of that route being, you know, uh, undercut. So what I'm trying to say is that what the efficiency reason that was behind the extreme comple complexity of manufacturing value chains somehow has been taken over by a, by a more comprehensive measurement of efficiency, even economic efficiency. This is not all about geopolitics. And I think it's, it's, it, this is what is coming to the realization that maybe, you know, I don't know, if you want to produce ibuprofen, it's not very difficult. You don't need to have 90 plus percent produced in China because that's a very simple thing to produce. And I think that concept has gained a lot of traction. I can tell you about the European Parliament, you know, basically discussing both new shoring and reshoring of manufacturing capacity, some of which may actually make economic sense. So I just wanted to add to the conversation the fact that I think barring, um, you know, the part of, of the value chain where, as Sean was saying, research and development or, you know, um, even data capacity or, you know, how important your, maybe your regulatory environment, think about, you know, China's security laws, China's, uh, um, you know, all, all of the things that oblige you to do something on the digital part, that's different. But for manufacturing, I just don't think that that's going to be as um, concentrated as it has been in the past. Now, can you do that? Can you disentangle, of course, the more manufactured goods take a car, become entangled to digital services, the harder this will be. So it all relies on how much of that manufacturing capacity does not depend on the soft part of the value chain. And I have to admit that for some goods, especially at the higher part of the value chain, this is increasingly difficult. But that's why I think it depends on where you want to stand. So if you have the ability to do the soft part, you know, your integration will be bigger. For the others, I think they will still try to keep that hard part of the of the value chain, the manufacturing, pure manufacturing part. So that would be my take as an economist. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alicia. Um, uh, and I, I really, you know, I take your point in, in terms of your last question, whether we can disentangle or not, um, and the challenges that will come with that, and the fact that it might be harder with traditional manufactured goods that then become more digital and uh, um, uh, require more digital components going forward. So thank you for that. Um, I'm conscious of time. I'm looking at the clock here. I haven't 
had Trisha wave any, any flags at me yet. Um, but we do have 15 to 20 minutes for an interactive conversation with um, those who have joined tonight's call. I guess, I think what would be uh, rather interesting for our panelists to, um, to, to discuss is, um, you know, moving forward. So next steps, like what, what do you think should now be done? What steps do you think should be taken to prepare for possible future global shocks? when it comes to diversification of supply, global trade and economic resilience, uh, if we are going to start rethinking these global supply chains. I might start with um, Sal. I can see Sal raising his hand. Yeah, Sal, please. To follow up on what Alicia mentioned, that the manufacturing goods, the traditional goods are having increasingly more digital components. Uh, this this is for, uh, you know, services. This is uh, for monitoring, uh, you know, remote monitoring. Uh, this is for making them more smart to operate more efficiently. Uh, and all these digital components require cross-border transfer of data. Now, if we want to have more resilient manufacturing systems, uh, we need to have a global pact on cross-border data transfers. And this should be, you know, uh, implemented, if not globally, between like-minded nations, democratic nations. Uh, so there could be a few data regions emerging in the world, like the trade regions. And I believe some of the emerging market countries, including India, should take the lead on bringing together like-minded emerging markets on these cross-border data, free, free cross-border data transfer areas to enable our supply chains to efficient in a resilient way, to be resilient to shocks that would, you know, uh, hinder uh, data transfer and uh, operating of these digital components. Thank you. Um, I wonder, Sunjoy, uh, if, given given Rasal's suggestion, um, what role do you think India could play going forward? Uh, Catherine, I think uh, fundamentally we also need to think while we're in the middle of this discussion. You know, it's, it's, we've all been talking about supply chains as if they were the best thing which happened in the last uh, 20, 30 years. Uh, but you need to realize that there were certain distortions in the way supply chains had come to exist. Uh, the fundamental distortion has been that uh, supply chains eventually have been more about capturing value at certain ends of the, at the top end. And the greater value gets captured at the top end. Uh, and fundamentally, when you looked at the construction of the supply chain, uh, the value of labor was demeaned in the, in the countries which, came, which became the factories of the world. Now, this is the whole big dispute which began between manufacturing, the hard part, and, and the soft part of the supply chain. Now, going forward, I think that is, that is one major distortion which needs to be corrected. In fact, that is the one big distortion which led to the kind of politics which you are seeing in the world today, why supply chains, the entire architecture of supply chains is being questioned in the US, uh, why questions have arisen as to uh, where jobs were near short, out short, how can they be brought back? Now, that those distortions in supply chain construction need to be eventually addressed. And yes, countries like India are going to be the key in correcting those kinds of distortions. The idea is not to replace the kind of manufacturing which you started seeing when, when certain countries became the factory floors of the world. I think we, we should move beyond that now. The idea is to move up the value chain, even and, and a very critical question which Shaw raised, how do smaller countries actually rise up the value chain? How do they have the bargaining power to climb up the value chain? Now, there are, there are a lot of questions here which need to be addressed within the policy framework of countries. There are lots of questions to do with skilling. Uh, if you're going more and more where larger parts of the value chain are going to become digital, more and more of manufacturing processes are going to become digital, then certainly it is up to the emerging markets and the smaller countries to put in place strategies which allow them to capture a greater part of the digital value. And that is where 
countries like India are going to play a very critical role. That's great. Thank you very much, Sanjay. Uh, Trish, are you having any more luck? Uh, yes, so we do have one question which kind of ties into the previous panel, which is yeah, this emerging concept of within this digital supply chain space of the IT and how that ties into it. Perhaps that could be something we have in effect. Great. Thank you, Tricia. I think the line is a bit bad, but then, Sean, if you heard that question, I might ask you to address that, given your work on cyber and, and um, security questions. S certainly. Thank you. Uh, and just straight to the point, I, I think there's a strategic uh, vulnerability concern, and it has a geopolitical feature to it because the greatest 5G hardware manufacturers and suppliers are Asian and European, and the greatest cloud computing data processing happen to be North American companies. And when you think about the dynamic data future, there's two components to it. There's processing and there's transport. And if the leading companies and providers for one of those are from North America, meaning the processing power, and the leading co companies for the transport are Asian, I see an inherent tension if there were to be times of geopolitical conflict or scarce resources. This goes to Asal's point about data regions and whether that'll come into play. And one of my greatest concerns in our discussion points for this panel, we talked about the lack of agility of governments to adapt with policies. There's one thing that governments are very good at doing and very agile and that is exercising their police power where they think national security is concerned, either national military security or national economic security. It may be very difficult to establish adaptive policies in regions or on a global scale, but it is quite easy for sovereigns to disrupt them. We've seen that in the medical supply marketplace uh, during the pandemic, and we can easily imagine it in technology components or in data transfers. We've seen it in data transfers before. So I think the question is a very astute one, tying together the previous panel in this, and it identifies an inherent tension just in where the global leaders are in those in two important aspects of processing and transport. Now, of course, in the 5G world, there will be more processing uh, happening at endpoints for certain localized services. And I'm not uh, oblivious to that. That certainly will be happening at local endpoints. But for the massive benefits, the AI-driven, systemic, high-value chain type of work that's happening at the major uh, computing centers of the greatest, largest companies, that is not going to be happening at every endpoint. So I offer that uh, reflection in response to the question. Uh, I see this as an inherent strategic tension going forward, especially where nations will seek to apply their sovereign power in a disruptive way rather than in an adaptive way. There's another couple of questions which I think we can take together because they're interrelated. One sure. is okay. that uh, governments and businesses especially during the pandemic, were forced to confront the fragility of the modern supply chain. Is there a need to redesign and create smarter, stronger, and more diverse supply chains? And then related, the push is to move supply chains out of China, but are we ready to contend with the unattended consequences? Tricia, would you mind repeating the second question again? Uh, the push is to move supply chains out of China, but are we ready to contend with the unattended consequences? Great, great, thank you. Um, uh, Alicia, I might ask you to respond to the first question about the diversification of supply chains that Tricia raised. Well, um, I think, you know, the story of uh, diversification doesn't start with the pandemic. 
we, we had unfortunate events before which led companies to diversify their value chain. I can think of, a, of the example of uh, um, flats in Thailand, and this is something like 2014, and the auto sector, and this was mainly Japanese, uh, to some extent Korean um, manufacturers in, in Thailand were severely affected by those flooding. And they basically decided to have, you know, a second point of entry. So I think any kind of um, natural disaster will prompt, and this is beyond geopolitics, um, manufacturers to, to have different uh, entry points. I can think of one more, which is actually in Turkey uh, for result, and this is Inditex. And they suffer from, I mean, they were sourcing from Turkey to Russia garment, obviously, and, and, you know, this was the unfortunate event of, you know, the airspace and the, and they, they actually got trapped into that. So that was a geopolitical reason. So, you know, there's many, many reasons why you suddenly realize that you should have two points of entry into a certain market. And, and I, I think this is why the pandemic is kind of, you know, multiplying that need by many, many times. But but it is new, and I think um, many uh, big companies have been thinking about that regionalization and still always have two entry points to a single market. This is only going to increase. But I do agree with Usal that the point, uh, important point is about digital services. I mean, how do you avoid getting trapped into or avoiding that diversification because you're trapped into a single um, digital space, which kind of forces you to to use your your data point, your end of data there. The example is, I think the best example I can think of of this, and it's, it is not data, but but it serves the purpose is TSMC here in, in Taiwan, and you know having two thirds of its exports into the U.S and being um, targeted by U.S. sanctions on on semiconductors um, towards Huawei and any uh, company in the identity list needs to decide whom to source and basically one only choice. Yeah, I mean, so so these kind of situations, I think, will will force if, if we are in that game to take one go or or several several entry points within that ecosystem. But the point is you can't diversify away into the other ecosystem. And I think that's the risk which was being discussed before. So it's important, indeed, very important. Thank you, Alicia. Um, I might ask, um, uh, I might ask Sean and Sunjoy to speak to the second question from a more geostrategic perspective um, of, about the consequences of moving supply chains away from uh, China. So I'll start with Sunjoy and then move across to Sean and then um, ask Asal if he has any, any thoughts too. Uh, that, that's an interesting question, Katriona. It's also interesting because uh, if I recall, China was already in the process of moving certain low-end components of the, pro the supply chain process, diversifying them into other countries. And this had started much before the pandemic. China was, if you, if you look at the entire narrative of the BRI, uh, the way China was marketing the BRI, and the countries it was getting into, was with the simple statement saying, China needs to relocate 80 million low-paying jobs to your nations. And we are going to be reconfiguring the entire value chain, and we will be moving up higher, and other countries will be moving, taking our place in that process. So in some way, that kind of offshoring had already started. The, as I said, the problem is not here. The problem is, where do countries place themselves along in this very, very complex value capture, which is part of the, which, which is the entire struggle in, in supply chain manufacturing, whether it is on the data side, whether it is, the, is it is on the hard side. Countries eventually, if you start looking at how supply chains are to be configured, need to ultimately capture more value in the process. Earlier supply chains, yes, were distorted. They need to be corrected. That means, yes, 
certain comp certain parts certain certain countries which are capturing more and more of the value need to be sharing more of that value with other nations that kind of restructuring will take place so i i look at the whole situation in a different context eventually the world whichever whether it is china whether it is the us will have to have their eye on where the markets are and markets do negotiate buyers do negotiate and then that very process of negotiation also reconfigures the value chain they are going to be bargaining for a greater share in the value chain thank you uh yeah thank you uh i think mr joshi has covered the important systemic and economic factors there so i have little to add i will simply note that there are certain instances where independence is so critical for national security that nations or companies are willing to overlook the economics or the cost effectiveness of things and then they will do it themselves in higher priced markets but those have traditionally been limited to very few sectors or very particular components in very few sectors where we have import and export restrictions on certain technologies uh for example so i think in 99% of the cases what has already been described will be what's playing out there is a natural move that was already occurring from china to other even uh, less expensive labor markets uh and i think some countries uh united states included europeans and others will look to that very limited number of sectors or components that they think are so critical to their national security that they want to have a fully self sufficient uh independent production capacity for and they'll make those at home even though they have a substantially added cost the 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 news on on news and um, Sal I'd be also really interested to hear your thoughts on that question from kind of a, a, an innovation perspective too the line was cut but let me uh, tell you my final thoughts I didn't hear the question but let let me tell you my final cost uh, thoughts sure. very yeah. briefly uh I think Uh, the reason we are suffering from all this confusion about international digital policies is the following for the manufacturing and traditional value chains uh, in as much as it is discussed and debated there is a global framework there is wto there are rules and you know companies are operating on these rules for digital there is no such framework so therefore uh the more we focus on establishing a framework uh a global framework or a multilateral framework around you know with like minded countries i think it will also be better for the manufacturing value chains to uh, operate more efficiently and in a more resilient fashion thank you Oh, thank you, Asal. Um, I, on, on that note, um, uh, and Trisha, I think we have reached time. I'll invite our other panelists to provide their last few comments or thoughts before we close out the session. So, Alicia, I might move to you first, and then um, uh, Sean and um, uh, Sunjoy to to close off the panel. Well, uh, to, in two words, I, it was a very interesting panel. I think what I take away from it is that. you know the if it oh, it was already very complex yeah we had a lot of things to take into account when um, setting up value chains in a country versus another and i think that realization that efficiency was what mattered is has been blown in a way that you know i guess whoever made it up uh, is probably feeling uh, very upset because it's so many more factors of course geopolitics uh natural disasters uh, the role of digital you know all of that is changing the that that soft and hard as i was trying to explain i mean all of that has changed so massively that the whole nature of value chains to me uh needs to be rethought because it's no longer about transiting stuff it's it's, it's much more complex than that 
And in, in, on that note, I think that we shouldn't even think about only nearshoring, reshoring, you know, the, the usual. It, it's really about the whole concept being totally redefined and the, and the relative importance of services, let alone digital services, versus what we used to know, which is just a manufacturing value chain. So, so that would be my thought. Thank you. A lot of work for, for experts going forward, if that's the case. Um, I'll ask Sean to provide his last comments and thoughts, um, uh, and then Sunjoy. Thank you, Katrina, uh, and thank you to all my fellow panelists. Uh, I think this year of 2020 has actually underscored that there are some things that may be even more important than financial profit or financial efficiency. And my two parting you know, thoughts or concepts would be cooperation where it's appropriate and possible and contingency planning for everyone. And this sort of brings us full circle back to where Sanjay Joshi started us talking about just-in-time logistics and some of their inherent vulnerabilities. Technology depends on people and processes. And if the people are stricken and not able to effectuate those processes, uh, the technology and the services may not be where we need them when we need them. So I come back to contingency planning has really been one of the major learning concepts of 2020, I think, for many nations. Uh, let, let me add uh, by way of conclusion to Alicia's arguments and uh, take that further. I agree with Alicia that supply chains themselves are in the process of being reconfigured. You know, more and more of the supply chain, the manufacturing, if you look at manufacturing, going into the future, manufacturing is going to become more and more digital. It's going to become more and more of a service. It does not strictly remain a manufacturing process. Now, when that happens, when you, when you get into the next phase of technology, you are going to see the supply chains anyway change shape. And that is, an, uh, no, that is the discussion I think we should now be having as to how this reconfiguration is going to be taking place and who are going to be the winners and losers in this process of reconfiguration. Great, thank you. Um, Trisha, I'm conscious of time. I, I'm not sure if our attendees have been leaving or whether you'd like to close the panel officially for ORS. Yes, so we're at time. Um, Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this panel, the most interesting way to end the day and the day's discussion. And thank you to everybody who has joined us online. Wishing you a good evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you are. And we'll be back tomorrow for day two of sci-fi. Great. Thank you, Tricia. Thank you, all our panelists. And uh, good evening, everybody. <laughs>